Hello and welcome to Paleo Logos. My name is Peter and thank you for joining me today as we take a look at the Neanderthals. They were an interesting group of humans who lived thousands of years ago in Europe and parts of Asia. We're going to take a little bit of a look at their discovery, the features which set them apart from us, and how they fit into a creationist framework of human history. Our story begins back in the 1600s with a man named Joachim Neander. Joachim was a German and he was born in the town of Dusseldorf. At a young age, he became the assistant pastor at the Reformed Church there, and he was put out of the ministry in about 1677 because of a dispute he had with his church. Only 14 days later, he repented and returned to his church, but legend sprang up that he had, during this time when he was deposed, gone to a nearby valley and lived in a cave, which probably are not true. Joachim was a bit of a hymn writer, and even today, some of his songs are popular among evangelical Christians. Uh, more than a hundred years after Joachim's death, the valley was being used for limestone mining. In the intervening time, the valley had become named after him. First, locals referred to it as Neandershole, meaning Neander's cave, referring to specifically the cave where they believed he had lived. And then the whole valley became called Neander Tall, Tall being the word for valley in German, so it's Neander's Valley in English. One day in 1856, the limestone couriers ran into a cave, and the cave was absolutely littered with bones. The foreman came over, and they removed some of the bones from this chamber. They found quite a few bones of the skull and the rest of the body, and they gave them to a man named Johann Karl Fulrot. The couriers thought that they were probably bones of a cave bear because they no doubt had seen bones of these types of animals before, they thought. But Johann Karl Fulrot, who was a nearby high school science teacher, noticed that they were unique, and so he went to a professor of anatomy and showed him the bones. The man recognized that these were not the bones of a bear, but were in fact human. But they also recognized that they weren't exactly like a modern human. They had something quite a bit different about them. William King described these bones and others in a paper called The Reputed Fossil Man of the Neanderthal. And he realized that Neanderthals were not just modern humans, but in fact made up their own species, which he named Homo neanderthalensis, after the valley where they were found. Soon afterward, all sorts of discoveries of Neanderthal material started cropping up. One of the very famous skeletons that was found was called the Old Man of La Chapelle. There was a famous paleoanthropologist named Marcellin Boulle who lived during the time of that discovery, and he became one of the first people to try to attempt a reconstruction of these humans. And so he, looking at the bones, decided that they were very ape-like, that the creature who it belonged to was no doubt very hairy, probably had a big toe that stuck out like an ape's and probably was all hunched over. And so he commissioned an artist and got this artist to draw a very famous painting of a Neanderthal. And it shows the Neanderthal as this backward caveman coming out of this cave aggressively. The ground is littered with bones. But that is in fact not at all a correct view of Neanderthals. And it's even inexcusable that 
Marcellin Boole came up with that because many of the features of anatomy which he directly studied contradicted his reconstruction of the Neanderthals. So what exactly were those features that prompted William King to define this new species of human, Homo neanderthalensis? Let's look at the bones of a Neanderthal. Let's begin by looking at the skulls. This is the skull of a Neanderthal from Israel, and this is a modern human skull. When we view both of them from the side, we can see that Neanderthals had a much longer skull than modern humans do. Modern humans have a nice rounded shape to their skull, whereas Neanderthals had more of an oval. It was a very long, rounded out skull. When we look at the face, we can see that Neanderthals had these big, bulbous ridges above their eyes, something that modern humans do not. And above those ridges, their forehead basically just sloped right backwards, whereas we have a very tall forehead. Their face also projected outwards quite a bit compared to ours. And there's a lot of other features which set the skull of the Neanderthal apart from that of the modern human. This is the tibia of a Neanderthal from the spy cave in Belgium. It's your lower leg bone. I have here the leg of a modern human and you can see when we compare this bone, it's this one right here in the skeleton, we can see that the Neanderthal tibia is quite a bit shorter than that of the modern human. That is something that's very consistent across Neanderthals. When we look at Neanderthal bones, they are usually quite short, even shorter than a lot of modern humans. And as we just saw, looking at just the length of the tibia, for example, you could see that it was quite a bit shorter than a very short modern human. Neanderthals were probably five foot, a couple inches, but some of them were much shorter. And one thing that does set them apart, besides just their shortness, is the size of their joints. This is basically part of your knee joint up here, the top of the tibia, and it is much, much larger joint surface than that which is in a modern human. And we see that also at your ankle joint. It is, once again, a very large joint surface compared to those that modern humans have. We see the same thing even in the toes of the Neanderthals. This is a phalanx of a Neanderthal, and it is an exceptionally large bone for your foot. And this shows, once again, that Neanderthals had these very large um, appendages. Their hands and feet and their joints were all very large. And the muscle structure uh, that we can see from their bones appears to have been very great. So, in other words, they had much larger muscles than modern humans do. So we get this picture of Neanderthals as the short, stocky people who are very muscular. This is a cast of a Neanderthal pelvis from Kropina, a site in Croatia. One interesting thing that we can see on this cast is this very large rounded area here. That is essentially the hole where your femur ball fits into. Your femur is the thigh bone, the area from your body to your knee. And that is all one bone called your femur, and it has this rounded head on it, which fits right into this location. What's interesting here is that this has a very large joint here. As we talked about earlier, obviously the ball of the femur must have been very large in this individual to fit into that space. So Neanderthals had all these interesting features which set them apart from modern humans. But a lot of people I talk to aren't comfortable designating them as their own species. A lot of people think that these characters are so extremely similar that they could just be modern humans 
and maybe modern humans are just more diverse than we really know. But that's not really the case. Statistical studies have shown that Neanderthals are separate from modern humans. They have features which are found in no modern humans anywhere in the world today. And so Neanderthals are their own separate group. Some people would say that Neanderthals are really just people who had bone diseases, and maybe that's why their bones look different. But people with diseases aren't strong and muscular like we can see from the muscle attachments on the Neanderthal bones. And there's a lot of other theories exactly why Neanderthals look the way we do. But the real answer seems to lie in two factors. One is some type of genetic change, and the second is perhaps adaptation to their climate. I said earlier that Neanderthals lived in Europe and parts of Asia, which during the time when occupied by Neanderthals were pretty cold places because this was during an ice age. And so Neanderthals living during this time would have experienced a bit of cold weather and their bodies appear adapted to that weather. For example, Eskimos today have very similar proportions in being very short and stout, so to speak, just like Neanderthals. And so Neanderthals may have been uniquely fit for that cold climate during that period and may have been able to thrive in ways that other human species couldn't because of their adaptations to the cold. Neanderthals may also have had certain unique factors which made them develop differently. When we look at the methylation, which is an interesting way of looking at how genes are expressed in a creature, it appears that Neanderthals had a different pattern than that of modern humans, and thus they developed differently. Now, one thing that makes Neanderthals as a species very interesting to study is that we know so much about them. There are hundreds of Neanderthals skeletons that have been found, and in addition to that, we also have their DNA. Neanderthal DNA has been recovered from many different specimens of this species, and so we have quite a good idea what Neanderthal DNA was like. We have different uh, types of DNA, like mitochondrial DNA, which is from one certain part of the cell, and then we also have the nuclear DNA, which is the main genetic code which it expresses what an organism will look like. And there's been certain theories such as possibly Neanderthals had a greater percentage of people with red hair because of certain genes that they had. And they also appear to have had a gene that would have helped with blood clotting. In a hunter-gatherer society like that which Neanderthals lived in, your blood wants to clot fast because if your blood clots slowly and you have a wound, you will bleed to death. Whereas in people like modern humans, we are often very sluggish compared to people who live in hunter-gatherer societies and thus, because we live somewhat sedentary lives, our blood can clot too frequently. And so that's one way in which the Neanderthals had a couple of unique genes which also allowed them to thrive in their environment. If you get your DNA tested through sites like 23andMe, you can find exactly how much of your DNA came from your Neanderthal heritage. Neanderthals' cultural objects were also very human. We have cave paintings that are ascribed to Neanderthals, all sorts of stone tools that are very finely made. We have evidence of Neanderthals using fire, uh, making rope, and of course burials. We have all sorts of Neanderthals which were buried and appear to have had a certain type of reddish mineral sprinkled on them in some type of ceremonial procedure after death. And so Neanderthals were very much humans. So how do we understand Neanderthals in light of what the Bible tells us about human origins? 
Are these people really descendants of Adam and Eve? Absolutely. After the Tower of Babel, it appears that humans migrated out from Mesopotamia into all the surrounding regions, but in very small family groups. And as a result, we have something called the Founders Effect. Uh, which would play on the genetics of these people to make them form their own unique genes and traits. And genetic drift would make their DNA change as a result of living in these small, uh, closely intermarried groups. And it appears that something like those circumstances led to the creation of this unique group called the Neanderthals. So why are Neanderthals no longer with us today? We don't really know the answer, but it's possible that Neanderthals intermarried with modern humans so much that their population was absorbed into our own. And so we, in fact, by interbreeding with the Neanderthals, completely absorb our populations into one single population that has now become worldwide and is known as Homo sapien. Thanks for listening. I hope you've learned a little bit about the Neanderthals. Don't forget to subscribe. About 96% of people who watch my videos aren't subscribed, so don't be part of that group. Thanks for listening.